Hello and welcome to this demonstration of EpiInfo version 7. My name is Eric Knudsen. I am an information technology specialist with the Epidemiology and Analysis Program Office, part of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And before I begin, I would just like to go over a very quick agenda. Um, I'm first going to talk a little bit about what EpiInfo is, for those that might not be familiar. I'm then going to discuss some of the core design principles that have gone into the new version. And then finally, I'm going to give a demonstration of some of the features and capabilities found in EpiInfo 7. So what is EpiInfo? Um, EpiInfo is a suite of free data management, analysis, and visualization tools designed specifically for the public health community. Um, it's used extensively not just at CDC, but also domestically at the state and local level, um, as well as internationally. EpiInfo allows you to rapidly create electronic data entry forms. Uh, these forms can have intelligence built into them, such that, for example, um, you can automatically calculate a patient's age based on the survey date and the date of birth. Um, you can also move the cursor past certain fields based on a variety of conditions. You can even hide and unhide fields based on um, various conditions. It also allows you to enter data into those forms. You can conduct various types of statistical analysis, um, including frequencies, two by two tables, analysis of variance, uh, conditional and unconditional logistic regression, kaplan meier survival analysis, uh, complex samples, um, and many others. EpiInfo also allows you to create uh, several types of maps. And it also has some graphing and charting capabilities. And finally, EpiInfo allows you to design and generate reports. We've found that um, EpiInfo currently averages about 227 downloads per day. Uh, the vast majority of these downloads come from the United States and we've registered at least one download from every one of the 50 state health departments. Now when users download EpiInfo from our website, they're given the option of telling us um, how many people they're downloading it for. And 7% of those users have indicated to us that they're downloading EpiInfo for 10 or more users. As we've been developing EpiInfo version 7, we've tried to adhere to a number um, of design principles. Uh, first among those is that we want EpiInfo to remain free. And when we say free, we don't just mean free to download, but we also mean free as in you won't need to buy any other software in order to get EpiInfo to work. Um, you'll be able to download EpiInfo from our website and begin running it without having to purchase any other um, additional software. We also want EpiInfo 7 to be easy to use. Uh, we want our users to be able to very quickly and easily figure out how to do certain tasks. And from the previous version of EpiInfo, we want to make sure that uh, the number of steps needed to do, do certain tasks um, is reduced. We also want EpiInfo 7 to be very flexible. And when we say flexible, we really mean two things. Uh, number one, we want EpiInfo to be uh, lightweight and agile, um, especially when responding to uh, emergencies. So that, for example, if you're uh, being deployed to a disaster area where there might not be any internet or infrastructure, um, we want EpiInfo 7 to to be usable in that type of scenario, that you can simply take it with you and begin working on, on whatever computers you happen to find um, on site. At the same time, we want EpiInfo to be uh, very robust. And what we mean by that is that it can work with very large sets of data. And so we've, de we've designed EpiInfo 7 to work not only with the traditional Microsoft Access database format, um, but it can now work with Microsoft SQL Server databases. And what this allows us to do is to work with gigabytes worth of data, um, thousands of fields, um, 
even millions or tens of millions um, of records. We also want EpiInfo 7 to be standards based. Um, and to that end, we have incorporated the FinVADS vocabulary system into the EpiInfo 7 form designer. And what that lets our users do is create their questions with um, standard public health responses so that uh, when the data is transferred, um, you know that the data is um, the data has been stored in a um, in a standard way. And last but not least, we have tried to um, eliminate the amount of IT support that is needed to use EpiInfo. So one of the things we've done with EpiInfo 7 is removed the requirement that um, it be installed to the computer. In fact, all you have to do to get EpiInfo 7 to work is to download it from our website um, and then run it. Um, you don't have to be an administrator. You won't need um, your IT support personnel to set it up for you or install it for you. Um, you can just download it and get right to work. In fact, you could download EpiInfo 7 directly to a thumb drive and take that thumb drive with you and wherever you happen to be, you can plug that thumb drive into a Windows computer and simply run EpiInfo 7 right from the thumb drive. And that concludes the PowerPoint presentation, so let's get to the demo. I'm going to launch EpiInfo right from the desktop. And what we're looking at now is the EpiInfo 7 main menu. From the screen, I can create electronic forms, um, enter data into those forms. I can do various types of analysis, um, and I can work with maps. I'm going to start off by showing one of the forms we've already created and entered some fake data into. Uh, this is an E. coli food history questionnaire. And as you can see, we're collecting some pretty standard information. We have a case ID. We have the date the patient was interviewed. Uh, we have first name, last name, uh, the patient's gender, date of birth. If I scroll down to the bottom half of the page, we can see that there's some additional, uh, there are some additional questions here on uh, the symptoms and the illness, uh, whether the patient was hospitalized, whether they were treated with antibiotics, uh, and whether they died. There's a second page for this questionnaire, which I can navigate to by clicking on page two in the list of pages. And on page two, we now have a group box of various foods that the patient might have eaten. And we have some lab tests and lab result questions as well. I can navigate through the records by clicking the next record and previous record buttons and it's also showing me that I have 359 total records now one thing that um, I mentioned at the very beginning was that EpiInfo questionnaires can have intelligence built into them such that, for example, we could skip the cursor past um, all fields related to pregnancy if I filled out male for the patient's gender. Now in this particular form, we have programmed it so that as soon as the cursor moves out of the date of birth field, um, it will automatically calculate the patient's age based on the date of interview and the date of birth and then automatically fill that value into the age field. So as I put the cursor into the date of birth field and then press tab, you'll notice that the age field was filled in with 29. Um, if I were to go back and change the date of birth to January 12, 2001, and then press tab, we see that the age um, is recalculated as 10. I can create a line listing right from within um, the enter module. I'm going to do that by clicking the line listing button at the top of the screen. 
Um, and it's going to give me several options for how I want to display this, this line list. I can create an interactive line list, which would allow me to uh, create various data filters. I can generate a printable line list, which will show up in whatever uh, web browser is the default on this computer. Or I can export that line list directly to Microsoft Excel. I'm going to go ahead and do the printable line list, and in a couple of seconds, I can see all of my data in Internet Explorer, and I can scroll down or scroll across. Now, one of the new features that we've added to EpiInfo 7 is called the Dashboard. And the dashboard is really just a quick way for our users to see what kinds of data they're collecting um, as the data is being collected. So I'm going to click this dashboard button at the very top of the screen. And the dashboard window appears, and it's showing me that I have 359 records. And it's also telling me to right-click on the canvas um, to add content. So I'm going to right-click. And it's now going to give me the option of adding um, several different gadgets. Um, I have various analysis gadgets I can add. Uh, if I want to do a frequency, I can add a frequency gadget. If I want to add a 2x2 two two table, I can add a 2x2 two two gadget. We also have gadgets for linear and logistic regression, uh, as well as the ability to create various types of charts. Um, I can also add um, various types of stat calc calculators. And we can also create um, some new stat growth charts. I'm going to go ahead and add a frequency gadget. And this gadget is going to ask me what field I want to run the frequency on. So suppose I want to see the number of ill patients and um, non-ill patients in this set of data. I can simply select the ill field from the list of fields on this questionnaire. And as soon as I do that, it's going to show me um, the results, which are that uh, we have 276 ill patients and 83 that are not ill. If I wanted to show the breakdown of males and females instead, I could select sex as the field to run the frequency on. And it's now showing me that I have 186 females and 173 males. I can stratify this frequency by clicking um, or by opening the advanced options panel. So we'll do a frequency on ill and then we'll stratify it by sex. And what we get now, um, or what we're showing now, is that we have 147 ill females and 129 ill males. I can also create um, some descriptive statistics for various numeric fields that I have in my questionnaire. So let's say I want to know the average age of patients in this set of data. I can simply select age as the field I want to run the statistics on. And in a couple of seconds it's going to show me um, the average age or the mean age is 36.5. And just like what we did for the frequency, I can also open the advanced options panel. In this case I'm going to cross tabulate by sex. And it's now showing me that the average age of females is 35.755, and the average age of males is 37.366. And because we've done a cross-tabulation, we're getting some additional statistics, in this case an analysis of variance. We also have a Bartlett's test, uh, Kruskal-Wallis statistics, um, and various others. I can also create a 2x2 two two table. 
and since this is an E. coli food history questionnaire, I'm uh, probably going to want to select one of the foods eaten as the exposure. So let's select strawberries as, or whether or not the patient ate strawberries as the exposure, and we'll let whether or not the patient became ill uh, be the outcome. And in a couple of seconds, it's going to show me uh, some pretty standard looking 2x2 two two results. I have the four colored squares. Um, I have an odds ratio, risk ratio, some p-values, and various other uh, statistics. Now I just want to go back to the form real quick. And on page two, if you remember, we had a number um, of checkboxes representing each one of the various foods that the patient might have eaten. And these foods are all contained in this foods eaten group box. Now if we were to go through and do one two by two table on each one of these um, checkboxes, it might take us quite some time. So what we've done in EpiInfo 7 is allow our users to run the two by two statistics over every one of the fields in, this, in a given um, group box. And in this case, we've called the group Foods Eaten. And so in the dashboard, I'm going to select the Foods Eaten group as the exposure. And it's now showing me a relative risk chart, where every row in this table represents one of the, uh, one of the foods that was in that Foods Eaten group. If you look very closely, you'll notice that as I highlight a row in the table, the 2x2 two two results update to reflect um, that particular food. So for example, when I click on beef jerky, it's now showing uh, beef jerky by ill with an odds ratio of uh, 0 0.96. When I click on grapes, uh, the, the statistics at the bottom now are updated to show uh, grapes by ill with an odds ratio of 0 0.5377. This chart is by default sorted by risk ratio, so we can see that bean sprouts has the highest risk ratio at 3.166. I can sort this by exposure if I would rather see the results alphabetically by clicking on the exposure column heading. I can also create various types of charts. So let's do an epi curve. And let's do the epi curve based on the onset date. So we're now looking at an epi curve. And this probably won't look like a real epi curve since the data that we're using uh, for this demo has been randomly uh, created. Now let me go ahead and do a frequency on age. Now you'll notice when I do the frequency on age, I'm seeing uh, one row in my frequency table for every single value of age that happens to be in the set of data, which probably isn't what I want to see. I would rather see this broken down into some kind of age groups or age categories. And thankfully, EpiInfo 7 um, allows us to do that using the Define Variables gadget, uh, which is this gadget on the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, and as I move the mouse over it, it just sort of uh, pops out. And I'm going to create a new variable. And I'm going to create it with a recoded value, since we want to recode the values in age uh, into some new variable that's going to contain the age groups. So for the source field, I'm going to select age. I'm going to call the new field age group. Now I could manually type in all of the, uh, the from and the to values to create the, uh, the, the various age groups, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and let EpiInfo do that for me by clicking the fill ranges button. And I'm going to select my start value as zero. 
I want the range to go up to 65 years, and I want it to increment by 10. I'm going to click OK, and those values are automatically filled into my uh, recode table for me. I want to click OK again, uh, the recode is applied. And now when I run a frequency, I have a new variable in the list called age group, and if I simply select that, it's now going to show me the breakdown um, of ages by the categories that I just created. I can also show um, those age groups graphically by creating a pie chart. and I can move the mouse over any one of the pieces of the pie to see uh, both the actual count as well as the percentage. And I can create custom titles and apply those to the chart. Now this is all very nice, but what if we want to run these statistics on only a certain subset of the data? For example, what if I only wanted to um, generate these results for mail records? Um, we can do that using the data filters gadget, which is this gadget on the right hand side of the screen. And just like with the defined variables gadget, I just have to move the mouse over it and it pops out. It's going to ask me what fields I want to create a filter for. So I'm going to select, since I only want to work with mail records, I'm going to select sex. I'm going to say sex is equal to mail. Then I'm going to click the add filter button and as soon as I do that all of the gadgets are automatically updated and refreshed to reflect the fact that we're now only working with uh, one, the 173 uh, mail records in this set of data. I can add multiple, um, I can have multiple filters active at once. So if I also wanted to filter by age, I can say the value of age is between 15 and 65. And now when I click Add Filter, it's going to ask me how I want to join this new condition with the condition that I already have. So I'm going to select um, to add this with an AND. And just like last time, all of the gadgets are going to automatically update themselves to reflect the fact that we're only working now with 153 records. And I want to point out that uh, the filter criteria that we've generated um, reads like an English sentence. Um, the value of sex is equal to male, and the value of age is between 15 and 65. So we've tried to make the data filters, uh, the data filtering capabilities, very easy to use. Um, and we've tried to make the filters themselves uh, very easy for our users to figure out. Now this is this is all very nice, but what if I've generated all of this output and I now want to send it to a colleague? Well, I can do that using the Save as HTML button at the very top of the screen. And when I click it, it's going to ask me where I want to save this output. Um, I'm going to save it to my desktop. We'll call it Demo Output. And now when I navigate to the desktop, we have a demo output HTML file which I can click on and it's going to open in Internet Explorer and I can now look at all of the results that I just generated. And I go back to our 
um, data entry screen, you might have noticed that we have this get coordinates button. Um, one of the ways in which or one of the various types of intelligence that can be built into EpiInfo forms is the ability to geocode an address into latitude and longitude. Um, that service is provided by Microsoft and therefore requires an internet connection. Um, it's also configurable so that if you would rather use a, a different service for the geocoding you can do so. Um, and I also want to point out that the geocoding is entirely optional um, and is not required to build forms. So if you don't want it, um, you don't have to use it. Now I already have 359 records with latitude and longitude filled in. So what if I wanted to display these cases on a map as a case cluster? Well I can do that using the um, mapping module. So I'm simply going to click this map button at the top of the screen. and I'm going to add a layer of data to this map and because all of my data is uh, in latitude and longitude I'm going to select uh, case cluster and it's going to ask me if I want to use external data now this would be really nice if I had um, my data in an Excel spreadsheet or a SQL Server database uh, but because all of my data is in EpiInfo 7 um, I'm just going to select no and it's going to ask me for the latitude and longitude fields and since I called my latitude and longitude fields latitude and longitude I'm simply going to select those options in the list of fields and I'm now looking at a case cluster map and I can use the mouse to move the map around I can use the mouse wheel to zoom out to get a more high-level view. Um, and when I zoom all the way out, I can see that I'm looking at the 359 cases. There are 359 records in this set of data. Um, I can zoom in to get a more detailed view. Um, one of the things you might have noticed is that uh, we have some single dots and then we have some dots that have a number inside representing the number of cases in that cluster. If I move the mouse over one of the case clusters, in this case this one has seven, you'll notice that it, it flares out where each one of these um, seven flares represent one of the seven cases in that cluster. Um, the maps module also has a bit of intelligence built into it in that each one of the cases that is displayed is linked to one of the records in the enter module. So for example if I'm looking at this map and I see this case down here on the southeast corner um, of this town and I, and I want to maybe investigate this case a little further um, I can simply double click on it and that case is loaded into the enter module for me and we can see that this is case ID 53 uh, Francisca Fisher uh, if we wanted to we could take a look at some of her uh, symptoms and perhaps some of the foods that she might have eaten and again I do want to point out that this data um, is all is entirely fictional and was created for demonstration purposes only Now one of the things I showed um, in the dashboard was that we um, was the breakdown of ill and not ill patients and you might have uh, as you might recall we only had about 270 something um, ill cases in this set of data so what if we only wanted to show those 273 um, ill cases on our map well we can actually use the same data filtering components um, in the maps in the mapping module that we used in the dashboard 
I can do that by moving the mouse over the map layers gadget at the bottom of the screen and clicking the data filters button and I can now select ill is equal to yes as my filter and when I click add filter the map has now been updated to reflect the fact that we're only working with or only showing the 270 um, ill cases in this set of data. I can also create stratified maps. So let's say for example I want to see male records as red dots and female records as blue dots. Well, I already have one layer with red dots, so I can set this layer's filter um, to only show male cases. And then I'm going to add another layer. I'm going to add another case cluster layer, and once again I'm going to say no to using external data. I'm going to change this layer's point color to blue and I'm going to set its filter to sex is equal to female and when I'm done picking the latitude and longitude fields it's now showing me um, a stratified case cluster map where the blue dots represent female cases and the red dots uh, represent male cases I can also show this data temporally. In other words, I can show the progression of cases over time. And I'm going to do that by clicking this Create Time Lapse button at the top of the screen. It's going to ask me which time variable I want to, uh, want to use for the time lapse. And since we've collected onset date, I'm simply going to select onset date as my time variable. And then I'm going to click OK. And I now have this um, time gadget at the bottom of the screen. And if I click the play button, it is going to show me the progression of cases um, over time based on the date of onset. And the graph that is being generated uh, would normally look like an epi curve, but once again, this is all fake data. Uh, so the epi curve probably won't look like uh, a traditional epi curve. I can pause, I can move the slider to any particular point in time that I want, I can increment by one day at a time or decrement one day at a time, or I can simply remove the gadget. Now one last thing to point out in the Enter module is this linked records panel at the bottom left corner of the screen. And what this allows us to do is conduct contact tracing. In other words, I can link one record to another and say, well, this record has been exposed from this record, or this record um, has been exposed from this other record. So in this case, we're looking at record one, Anna Mueller, and we can see that she has been exposed from record number 50, Mandy Mueller, and record number 13, uh, Bodo Bauer. If we click on the Exposed To tab, we can see that Anna Mueller has exposed to uh, record number 99, uh, Simon Mueller. Now if I were to click on uh, record 50, record 50 will automatically load for me and I can now follow up with this case. It's now showing me Mandy Mueller. And I can look at the various foods that she might have eaten um, and take a look maybe at some of the symptoms that she had. 
We can also see that Mandy Mueller has been exposed from case ID 7, uh, Leonie Schultz. And if I were to click on um, this icon, it would take me to uh, case ID 7. Now what the exposed from and exposed to uh, tabs let us do is create a directionality of exposure. So in this case, Anna Mueller has been exposed from these two records and, has been ex is, and is exposing to record number 99. Now we can view all of these different relationships um, in a social network analysis graph by clicking the View SNA Graph button. Um, the, and the red dot in the center represents the record we're currently looking at, which is record number one. And we can see that record number one has been exposed from, by looking at the, uh, the direction of the arrows, it's been exposed from record 13 and record 50, and is exposing to record number 99. And if I wanted, I could double click on any one of these circles to take me directly to that record. Now some of you might be wondering how exactly are these forms created in EpiInfo? So let me go back to the EpiInfo menu and let's create a new form. So I'm going to create a new project and we'll, maybe we'll call this uh, medical records and we'll give it a form name of survey and you'll notice that we have the option here of either creating this project as a Microsoft Access database or we can create it in Microsoft SQL Server. Um, I do want to point out that you don't have to have Microsoft Access installed on the system in order to use um, the Microsoft Access option. Um, and because I don't have a SQL Server available to me, I'm just going to go ahead and, and keep this as the default. And I'm going to click OK. And at this point, I can simply start adding fields. So I'm going to right click on the canvas. And I'm going to select New Field. And let's create a, a last name field. So we'll create the last name field as a text field. And let's create a field for the patient's age. And we want that to be numeric data only, so we'll create that as a, a number field. And if I wanted, I could specify a range of values for this field. I can also specify a specific pattern that the input has to match. And I'll create another field for the patient's date of birth, and I'll create that as a date field. And just like with the number field, I can set a range of valid date values. And maybe I want to give this questionnaire a title, so I'll create a label title field. And we'll give it a nice big font to make it stand out. And I can move these fields around by um, clicking and dragging the prompt. I can move the input box independently of the prompt if I wanted it on the left side or right side. And if I want it to go back to its default, I can simply right click on the prompt and select default prompt align. I can select the fields as a group and move them all as one. I also have various options for um, aligning the fields. Now 
And I can also undo and redo various actions using the undo and redo buttons at the very top of the screen. Now one of the things we've found is that uh, for many of our users, they're creating many um, different data entry forms. And on many of these forms, they're using the same fields um, over and over again, such as last name, first name, age, date of birth, address, um, and so forth. And so what we've done in EpiInfo 7 is add a new feature called templates. And what templates allow you to do is very quickly um, create a standard set of fields. So if you notice, we have this template options on the left side of the screen. And I'm simply going to expand the fields templates, or the field templates. We have a couple of them here, demographics, diagnosis, uh, geolocation, and medical facility. I'm simply going to click and drag the demographics template onto the canvas. And in a couple of seconds, it has created um, a number of demographic fields for me. Now I can modify this if I want. For example, if I didn't want to collect any information on the patient's phone numbers, I could simply highlight the phone number fields and delete them. And I could rearrange these fields if I didn't like their placement. And it's also very easy for users to create their own templates. So for example, if I wanted to create a template for the last for this last set of fields, I could simply select those fields, right click on the canvas, and then select this option that says save selection as template. And we'll maybe call this demo template. And demo template now shows up in the list of templates that is available to me. So that concludes the demonstration of EpiInfo version 7. I'd like to thank everyone for their time and interest. And if you have any questions, please send them to epiinfo at cdc.gov.